honourable members, the President. Are there any questions today? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks, Madam President. My question about notes that some is given is the Leader of the House representing the Premier at C1339. I refer to your response to question without notice 11158 asked on October 22, 2020, and ask one, was the Lottery West Board decision on the rejection of the grant proposal by Margaret Court Community Outreach operating through Mar uh, Victory Life Services unanimous? Two, will you table the minutes of the board meeting which made the decision on the application with appropriately redacted details? And if not, one. Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, one yes, two yes, I ta table the attached. Oh. Thank you. That document is tabled, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam President, if you've done that at estimates, he wouldn't have had to worry. Um, my question without notice, which not, some notice is given, is the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to the radio advertisement on controlled borders currently being played on radio, where the Premier provides a voiceover and asks, one, how much money has been spent uh, to date on these radio ads, two, what is the total cost of the radio ad campaign, and three, for how long will this radio ad campaign run? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, one to three, I'm assuming the Honourable Member is referring to the radio spots that inform West Australians of the latest health advice and changes with regards to travel into Western Australia. The total cost of the radio spots will be $117,193. Spend to date is $52,414. They're running for four weeks in total. This includes four weeks on regional radio and three weeks on metropolitan stations and Aboriginal radio. The State Government continues to ensure important COVID-19 advice and public information is made available to West Australians across a range of channels and platforms and reflects the latest health advice. I note this is in keeping with the request from the now Opposition Leader, the Member for Dawesville's correspondence dated 1st of March 2020, to the Minister for Health in which he wrote, there is no doubt that a high profile public information and advertising campaign activated across all media outlets and mediums will have a beneficial impact and may go some way to helping protect us all should coronavirus reach Western Australia, I remain concerned that in the absence of any campaign, misinformation, unfounded fears and panic may result. I trust this public communication of the latest health advice is not being undermined by the Honourable Member, given the Leader of the Opposition's pledge yesterday to accept the health advice and his support for its high-profile communication. Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam President. I feel much more reassured having dear leader tell me over the radio. <laughs> Member, you might want to ask a question. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some has been given, is directed to the Leader of the House representing the Attorney General. Given that the government has chosen to leave vacant since 28 April this year, the position of Commissioner of the Corruption and Crime Commission because it could not get its way in appointing its preferred candidate. One, to what extent has the lack of a full-time commissioner significantly disrupted or compromised operational activities? Two, provide evidence to support those assertions. Three, have you since April asked for or received any further reports from the Commission of ongoing or emerging investigations? And four, if so, when and for what purpose? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, the government has not chosen to leave this position vacant. The government continues to support the candidate, the Honourable John McKechnie QC, put forward by the nominating committee that was chaired by the Chief Justice of Western Australia and has. Order. 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 The Minister has been asked a question. The Minister is trying to reply to the question. If you'd like to hear the answer, you'd let her continue. In. Thanks, Madam Chair, and has been blocked in its attempts to reappoint him. The Honourable Donna Farragher. The Honourable Donna Farragher. You got your answer. Call it that, um, Madam. That's the way they go. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Thank would you like a question? I, I, I would. Thank you. I know. Um, thank I you, you Madam President. Madam President, my question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Education. I refer to pre-primary enrolment requirements and requests received on occasion by school principals from parents seeking some flexibility in the school starting age for their children, and I ask one, can the minister confirm that principals have the authority to make decisions regarding year group placements? Two, if yes to one, a, what matters are taken into consideration by principals in making such decisions where a request has been received for some flexibility, and b, are there any mechanisms by which parents can seek to appeal a decision of a principal, and if so, will the minister provide further detail? 
Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One yes. Two a principals consider the parents' reasons for making the request, as well as other relevant information provided by health professionals, school psychologists, or educators who know the child. B. Principals are best placed to make these decisions in consultation with the family. In the event that parents are not satisfied by the outcome determined by the principal, they may request a review be undertaken by the local regional executive director. Uh, following that, a parent may request that the procedure by which the principal made the decision be reviewed by the Minister uh, for Education under Section 223 of the School Education Act. I might just add um, that goes to uh, the process. I can't make a review the, the merit or otherwise. Uh, the Minister is not obliged to conduct a review. Madam President, my question with that notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Commerce. I refer to the statutory reviews mandated under our state's laws, and I ask one, has a statutory review been conducted in accordance with section 13 of the Business Names Commonwealth Powers Act 2012? Two, has a statutory review been conducted in accordance with section 14 of the Petroleum Retailers Rights and Liabilities Act 1982? Three, has a statutory review been conducted in accordance with section 33 of Gas Supply Gas Quality Specifications Act 2009? Four, further to one, two and three above, when did the reviews commence, when were they completed and when will the minister table the review reports? Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I thank the member for the question. The following information has been provided by the Minister for Commerce. One yes, two yes. Three, the Gas Supply Gas Quality Specifications Act 2009 is administered by Energy Policy of WA, which, of which the Minister for Energy is the responsible minister. As such, this part of the member's question should be referred to the minister representing the Minister for Energy. Four, the review of the Business Names Commonwealth Powers Act 2012 WA commenced in 2017. The final report from the review was tabled in Parliament on the 8th of May 2018. The review of the Petroleum Retailers' Rights and Liabilities Act 1982 WA was due to commence in 2005 but was deferred due to pending regulatory changes by the Commonwealth. The review has been undertaken during 2020 and a final report is currently being prepared. Honourable Jackie Bordell. Madam President, uh, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the Aboriginal Males Healing Centre, AMHC in Newman, and the associated Papaginia Aboriginal Community Safety Project, and I ask one, have the Department of Communities received any requests for, had any discussions with, or undertaken to provide funding for either the AMHC or the Papaginia Aboriginal Males Healing Centre to assist with running programs or housing? If yes, please detail. To to uh, please table any changes between the 2019, 20 and 2021 financial years to government funding for organisations focused on the prevention of family and domestic violence programs. And three, given the minister has previously stated her support for programs, working in partnership with Aboriginal communities and supporting local Aboriginal initiatives, does the minister plan to assist these organisations which provide essential services in Newman? And if no, why not? Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, the Department of Communities continues to engage with uh, Mr Devon Quimera, CEO of the uh, Aboriginal Males Healing Centre, on a range of matters, including requests for assistance and funding. Two, in 2019-20, the Department of Communities provided $44,791,837 in government funding focused on the prevention of family and domestic violence as follows. Uh, family Domestic Violence Services, $39,735,195. Uh, family Domestic Violence Grants, $5,056,642. Uh, in 2020-2021, the Department of Communities will provide $46,885,579 in government funding focused on the prevention of family and domestic violence as follows. FDV services, $40,497,003. FDV grants, uh, 
Uh, three, the McGowan government is committed to addressing family and domestic violence through the path to safety. Western Australia's strategy to reduce family and domestic violence 2020-2030. The Department of Communities has partnered with various Aboriginal community controlled organisations, ACOs, to build their capacity as effective organisations throughout Western Australia. Communities engages with Aboriginal people, families and communities to support access to culturally informed and Aboriginal-led service responses and culturally secure mainstream service delivery. The CEO of the Aboriginal Males Healing Centre is a current member of the Department of Communities Aboriginal Community Controlled Organisations Strategy Project Working Group. The Honourable Colin de Grusso. Madam President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Agriculture. I refer to a question without notice 1171 and the Minister's response to part five of that question, and I ask one. Given the level of community objection demonstrated through Petition 160 by a security levy imposed on residents of Boyup Brook, tabled in the Legislative Council, the low rate of response from the Boyup Brook Shire area of 1.2 per cent of landowners and that 83 per cent of respondents oppose the levy, can the Minister outline how the requirement to demonstrate community support has been met in respect of the levy imposed on landowners in the Boyup Brook Shire? Minister for Regional Development. Uh, look, I thank the member for the question. I, I acknowledge that uh, the uh, uh, the Shire, the uh, uh, Boyer Brook Shire, has been uh, running a war of attrition uh, against the Blackwood Biosecurity Incorporated, and I, and I really think what they have been doing is is quite disgraceful. Uh, certainly, when the times that we've written out uh, to those uh, those um, uh, the landowners in the, uh, the Boy Up uh, Brookshire. We have very low uh, response rates. Um, and indeed, this year, when we did the general advertisements in the local papers, we had a total of, uh, of two responses. Uh, and we are aware that the Shire has been actively going out there um, uh, uh, are urging people um, not to uh, not to pay their rate, refusing to provide the rating detail, uh, and indeed causing a situation where the leadership of this group, which are incredibly dedicated individuals, volunteers, are really coming to the end of their tether. And the fantastic work that has been done, and this uh, the BBI was set up uh, under the previous government and it, it has been, uh, it has done some extraordinary work. If you just look at the projects that it's been, uh, that it has been uh, running uh, and, and the success. Uh, in the last two years, um, they have removed uh, uh, 1,500 foxes. They've had their very successful fox hunts and have been able to get rid of uh, 1,500 foxes. In the last 18 months, uh, they have removed 530 feral pigs. So yeah, we'll certainly be um, uh, considering this and trying to engage uh, and seeking to engage with the uh, community. We're not seeing any of this come out from the correspondence and the advertisements that we're having, but we do acknowledge that the Shire President and the former Shire President, who's been putting his his uh, petitions in the Mitre 10 uh, and wording everyone up uh, to sign it is, uh, is having uh, what no doubt is his uh, desired impact, which is to destroy this, um, what has been since 2014, a very, very successful organisation. So but we will certainly um, be considering the petition. Honourable Charles Smith. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is directed to the Minister for Education. I refer to the West Australian curriculum and ask one, can the Minister name anything in the school curriculum that is designed to foster among students a healthy sense of respectful pride in Australia and the country's achievements? Two, can the Minister provide detail on any part of the curriculum designed to help students develop an understanding and appreciation of our country's Western civilisational heritage? Leader of the House. Thanks, Honourable Member. Uh, I thank you for some a notice of the question. One to two, the WA Curriculum and Assessment Outline sets out the following values which underpin the curriculum and what students should value as a result of their learning at school. Respect and concern for others and their rights, pursuit of knowledge and commitment to the achievement of potential, self-acceptance and, self and respect of self, social and civic responsibility and environmental responsibility. Further, the teaching of history, 
uh, and civics and citizenship to enable students to develop a lifelong sense of belonging to and engagement with civil life, civic life as an active and informed citizen in the context of Australia as a secular multicultural nation, knowledge of the values, principles, institutions and practices of Australia's system of democratic government and law and the role of the citizen in Australian government and society, and a knowledge, understanding and appreciation of the past and the forces that shape society. Further, Year 11 and 12 Politics and Law Studies uh, course develops students' knowledge of the principles, structures, institution and processes of political and legal systems, primarily in Australia. The Hon. Colin Ticknell. Mr. President, my question without notice, of which some notice is given, uh, is to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Transport, regarding delays in regional transport services. Um, in this year's annual report, I observed that not one of the four regional train services met their on-time running KPI, with the prospect of missing its uh, OTR of 80 per cent by 70, 20 per cent, 27 per cent, giving it a score of 53 per cent. In the annual report, delays were attributed to signalling issues and track works managed by a third party. I ask, one, can you elaborate on what is meant by track work issues? Two, uh, who are the third party contractors? Three, do these contractors uh, contain any provision for damages for excessive delays? Uh, if so, what are they? And four, alternatively, is there any incentives to minimise disruptions? Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Madam President. And I, thank, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to two. Uh, Western Australia's rail freight network, including the line on which the prospector operates, was privatised by the former court Liberal government and is now leased to ARC Infrastructure. ARC Infrastructure is responsible for operating and maintaining the line. Track work refers to physical maintenance work on the track, including repair and replacement of rail infrastructure overseen by ARC Infrastructure. Three, the track access agreement with ARC Infrastructure does not have penalties for late running. Four, there is a performance incentive scheme as part of the track access agreement. The Honourable Alison Zamon. President, my question about notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Corrective Services. I refer to the answer to my question on notice 3025 and to the review of the prison's order for disruptive prisoners. And I ask one, has, the, has this review now been completed? Two, if yes to one, A, what were the findings of the review? And B, has the review recommended that the order be abolished or amended? Three, have any permanent changes now been made to the order? Four, if yes to three, what changes? And five, if no to three, why not? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Corrective Services. One no, two to five, not applicable. The honourable Robin Chappell. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is directed to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I refer to the letters sent to the Department of Planning, Land and Heritage, DPLH, by Green Legal on behalf of Fortescue Metals Group, FMG, in relation to their Solomon Mining Infrastructure Project, Phase 5, and outlining FMG's refusal to follow the recommendations of the Aboriginal Cultural Materials Committee. And I ask, can the Minister confirm that the letter from Green Legal on the 22nd of April states the ACMC does not have the power under the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972 or otherwise to direct FMG or, in brackets, any land owner to complete any action. FMD, FMG does not intend to complete, uh, sorry, does not intend com uh, completing the actions. Is it standard practice for proponents to reject or refuse an action proposed by the ACMC in respect of consultation with traditional owners? Three, is it standard practice for the proponents to influence the decisions or actions of the ACMC? Four, if no to two, does the minister consider this refusal to be good practice uh, generally by proponents? Five, if no to four, will the minister intervene in his capacity as Minister for Aboriginal Affairs? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some knowledge of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. One, I am advised that Green Legal, on behalf of the F FMG, wrote to the Registrar of Aboriginal Sites as outlined in the honourable member's question. 
two no, three to five. Proponents are required to provide information to the Aboriginal Cultural Material Committee (ACMC) so that it can undertake its responsibilities under Section 18.2 of the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972, which includes determining whether there are, there are any Aboriginal sites on the land, the importance and significance of any such sites, and making a recommendation to the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs as to whether or not consent should be granted and any conditions. The ACMC undertakes its functions diligently and in good faith. The Minister has previously expressed his expectations, both publicly and directly to proponents, that proponents will consult and engage respectfully and constructively with traditional owners in relation to the, to the identification, protection and management <coughs> of Aboriginal cultural heritage. Honourable Simon O'Brien. Uh, I have a question without notice to the uh, Minister for Agriculture. Uh, I refer to the Veterinary Practice Bill 2020 and I ask one, am I correct in my presumption that this legislation is so urgent it had to be introduced the day before Parliament finishes? Two, if so, after the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation reports on this bill on or about January the 9th, will, are you going to insist that Parliament be recalled to deal with the bill? And three, if not, why have you introduced it? Minister I th thank you, Member, for the question. Uh, uh, this bill uh, uh, has been kicking around since 2006. So we, if we recall, as I set out in the second reading speech, uh, that there was an agreement in 2006 that we would, uh, uh, that we would uh, move towards uh, uh, mutual recognition. And I think, as I also referenced in the second reading speech in 1995, we, made, uh, we entered into an agreement to uh, uh, change the rules in relation to the ownership of vet practices. Now, uh, this, of course, this of course has has uh, has uh, has uh, taken some time. Obviously, I think uh, your mob were in there for about eight and a half years. Uh, not a lot of progress was made. Uh, we we did come into uh, when I came into uh, into uh, government. Uh, it was put up to me, the, a version of the bill that was put up to me. Um, unfortunately, uh, that version of the bill uh, was not terribly competent, it uh, turned out. Uh, we did have, um, and I would love to have an opportunity to talk about it one day, but some very deep, profound problems within the legal department of the old Department of Agriculture at that time, which we did eventually sort out. Uh, anyhow, after uh, getting uh, a new and very professional uh, legal team onto the case and doing detailed work, we've done it and we've got it. So I wanted to make sure after from 2006 to now, now that we actually got a bill, I was going to get it in before the House and hopefully, hopefully when we come back after the next election, uh, this piece of legislation will be ready to go. You would have had ample time to review it and I look forward to your fulsome support. The Honourable Colin Holt. President, order. The Honourable Colin Holt. Member. Member The Honourable Colin Holt. Thanks, Madam President. My question, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. Has the Government, the Attorney-General or Police Commissioner received an ex gratia payment request from retired Police Officer Laurie Morley? Um, if so, what is the status of the request? When can Mr Morley expect an answer from the Government? And C, given Mr Morley lodged the request over 18 months ago, does the Minister consider this is an appropriate time for Mr Morley to wait for an answer to his request? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President, and I thank the honourable member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. The Western Australia Police Force advised the submission has been received on behalf of Mr Morley, and the State Solicitor's Office is providing advice on this matter. Mr Morley will receive a response as soon as possible after that advice has been received and considered by government. Importantly, medically retired police officers can access funding for medical expenses for a work-related injury or illness through the former Police Officers Medical Benefits Scheme. 
McGowan government has supported and recognised medically retired police officers through the $16.1 million redress scheme, which provided payments of up to $150,000 to former police officers medically retired due to a work-related illness or injury, and reforms to the Police Act 1982 to create a new standalone scheme to medically retire injured or ill police officers, which is completely separate from the completely inappropriate Section 8. Building on these initiatives, the government has also committed to implement a police compensation scheme for officers who can no longer serve due to a work-related injury or illness. The Honourable Robin Scott. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for the Environment, representing the Minister for Police. I refer to an article published today by Erin Park of the ABC Kimberley, the headline of which reads, Broom car theft spree leaves a trail of torched vehicles with residents, tourists demanding action. This article comes after 40 cars have been stolen in 30 days. I also refer to my question C1323, which asked whether the Minister intended on meeting Broom residents and to which I got a poor response. I again ask, one, can the Minister confirm whether or not she is arranging to meet the Shire and the residents of the town to address the issue? Two, if no to question one, why not? Three, if yes to question one, when will this meeting be held? And four, does the McGowan government have any plans to change its failing policy to address antisocial behaviour in regional towns? Minister for the Environment. Thanks, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. The following answer has been provo provided to me by the Minister for Police. One to four. The Western Australia Police Force advised senior police will attend the meeting. Organised by the Shire and Broome Police continue to target crime hotspots, respond to any reports of suspicious behaviour or crime. This explicitly includes stealing of motor vehicles as a priority offence. Measures are in place to target suspected offenders and offending, which includes the rollout of new technology. Youth crime issues remain a priority for Broome Police, and every opportunity is taken to break the cycle of crime committed by young persons, including in partnership with other agencies. Under the McGowan government, there are 120 more officers in, in regional <coughs> WA compared to the previous Liberal National Government. The McGowan government has also committed and put funding on budget to recruit an additional 800 police officers. 98 of the first 200 of these officers will be deployed to regional WA. The latest crime, police crime statistics published on the WA Police Force website show crime in regional WA was down 30.2 per cent on the same quarter last year. The Honourable Tim Clifford. President, my question, with, uh, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Commerce. I refer to Rewards expected, uh, expects 20 per cent Perth rental increase from March when COVID-19 emergency ban ends from the West Australian on November 2, 2020. And I ask one, will the Minister confirm that the moratorium on evictions and rent rises will not be extended, will not be extended beyond March 2021? And two, given the record low vacancy rate and projected rental hike of 20 per cent come March, what will the McGowan government do to secure immediate housing options to, to be delivered this financial year for those who have been priced out of the market? Minister for Regional Development. I thank the uh, member for the question. The following information has um, been provided by the Minister for Commerce. One, the Minister of Commerce noticed in, uh, noted in his appearance in the Legislative Assembly Estimates Committee hearings on 22nd October 2020 that the emergency period will not be extended unless there is a calamitous second wave that absolutely disrupts the WA economy. Two, the McGowan government provides a, provides a range of policy responses to address movements in the broader housing market. These include the investments in social and affordable housing made through the $394 million Metronet Social and Affordable Housing Package, the $151 million Housing and Homelessness Investment Package and the 319 million social housing economic recovery package. In addition to these investments, the Department of Community provides a range of services, including rental assistance and bond loans to those in housing needs and who may not specifically require a publicly owned house. The Honourable Ken Baston. That notice, with some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Housing. One, what is the breakdown of cost of the $17,175 average operating cost per public rental property? Two, does the $17,175 include or exclude rental income from the property? Three, 
Why is the actual cost so much higher than target costs for 2019-20? Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Madam President, and I thank the, the honourable member for some notice of this question. Uh, uh, in 2019-20, uh, the actual component costs for, uh, of efficiency key performance indicator 1.1, uh, average operating cost per public rental property, were the following. Madam President, uh, the answer is in tabular form. It lists the component costs of service and the year spend actual. So I ask, uh, I seek leave to incorporate that into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to incorporate that information into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted, the Minister. Thank you. It should be noted that some cost component costs above, such as construction and associated administration costs that are capitalised, are excluded from the calculation of the KPI. Two, rental income is excluded. Three, the actual spend of 17,175 exceeded the target of 14,550 for efficiency key performance indicator 1.1 due to increased maintenance expenditure and an increase in the expected rate of default for payment of rent from customers as a result of the effects of COVID-19. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development. I refer to Legislative Council question on Notice 1075 answered on 9 May 2018, and specific, specifically local projects, local jobs grants awarded in Geraldton and the Midwest. I ask one, please identify the projects that were funded in the region and the funding amount. Two, please advise if any of the projects changed in scope between the funding commitment being made and the grant agreement, and if so, detail the change. Three, have all, the, all of the granted funds been acquitted, and if not, please detail. And four, given Geraldton was the only place in my electorate that was granted local projects, local jobs funding, can you please advise how other communities in other locations can access funding under your scheme? Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I, th I thank the member um, for, the, uh, for the question. Um, one to two, I tabled the attached information identifying the list of projects that were funded in the City of Greater Geraldton, the funding amounts and the project uh, which has been varied. Three, uh, out of 34 projects in, in total that were funded, 26 have been acquitted to date. Two have been completed and are under assessment and six projects remain in progress. Uh, four, this is not an ongoing program. It was an election commitment for term one. That document is tabled. The Honourable Diane Evers. Thank you, Madam President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Environment. I refer to the site management plan for the decommissioned Dalyellup Waste Residue Disposal Facility, tabled paper number 4615, and I ask, one, has the Department of Water and Environment Regulations received annual environmental reports for 2018, 2019, 2020 as required by the plan? Two, if no to one, when is it, is it expected to receive them? Three, if yes to one, Will the minister please table a copy of each, electronic only is preferred, mm -hmm. and four, will the minister please table a copy of Tronix's final closure plan for the Delia Waste Residue Disposal Facility, version 3, July 2018, and if so, why not? Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President. Uh, I thank the honourable member for some notes of the question. I note in the question that was lodged, uh, you say electronic only is fine, not electronic only is preferred, so th there is that uh, difference. Uh, one, the Department of Water and Environment Regulation DEWA, has received the 2019 and 2018 annual uh, environmental reports. Two, the 2020 annual environmental report has not been received, as it is not due to be submitted to DEWA until June 2021. Three, I table the 2019 and 2018 annual environmental reports. Four, DEWA has advised that Tronox is currently updating the final closure plan for the Dalyellup Waste Residue Disposal Facility as a result of a review from the department. Uh, I table version three of the plan, which is currently being finalised, currently being revised. Those documents are tabled. The Honourable Yorn Sibber. I'm just waiting for my question to come back up. There we go. Um, my question, without notice of which some notice has been provided, is to the Minister for Environment, representing the Minister for Planning. And I refer to the City of Joondalup Draft Scheme Amendment Number Five, and I ask: One, when did the Statutory Planning Committee of the WAPC consider the Scheme Amendment, and what was their decision? Two, when did the WAPC pro provide you with a brief regarding the Scheme Amendment, and what is their recommendation? Three, what is the nature of the WAPC's engagement with the City of Joondalup with respect to finalising the Scheme Amendment? And four, when does the Minister expect to approve the Scheme Amendment? 
Minister for the Environment. Thanks very much, Madam President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to four. The statutory planning committee considered the amendment on the 27th of October 2020 and resolved to provide a recommendation to the Minister for Planning. The SPC recommendation was informed by engagement between officers of the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage and the City of Joondalup. Recommendations in relation to local planning scheme amendments have always been treated confidentially by every government to avoid decisions of the Minister for Planning being preempted or unduly influenced. Once the Minister has made a final decision on this amendment, the Minister will release information on that decision. Leader of the Opposition. Without notice, what some is given is the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to your response to question without notice 1158 asked on October 22, 2020, and I ask one. Did the Board of Lottery West Access or receive any legal advice before rejecting the grant proposal by the Margaret Court Community Outreach operating through Victory Life Services? Leader of the House. Uh, 1340. Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, one no. Madam President, I ask the business of the House be resumed. Business of the House is resumed. Are there any further answers? The Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam President. I'd like to provide an answer to the Honourable Michael Mission's question without notice. 1308. Asked yesterday, and I seek leave to have that incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to incorporate that answer into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Oh, thanks, Ma'am. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Leave is not granted. You will need to read that answer in. One. Lottery West has an overarching risk assessment framework based on uh, ISO 31000-2018. This framework is applied, uh, applied whereby the impact likelihood and Lottery West's tolerance of the risk is considered. For grants, the risk assessment criteria includes eligibility of organisation and purpose of grant, proposed evaluation of approved purpose, project complexity, budget and timeframe, project planning, organisation's capacity to deliver, grants history if applicable, known external factors that may challenge the delivery of the approved purpose, the use of the funds requested, charitable purpose, conflicts of interest, grant purpose results in negative impact for Lottery West reputation, conduct of grant customer results in negative impact for Lottery West reputation. Three, the issue of harm is not a specific criteria, however it is considered in the context of impact. Four, yes, risk assessments for all applications are saved in the grant management system. And, Madam President, Leader of the House, I table the documents in relation to questions. Question on notice numbers 3348, asked by the Honourable Nick Goran, and 3350, asked by the Honourable Aaron Stonehouse. Those documents are tabled. Are there any further answers? The Minister for the Environment. Madam President, I table documents in relation to question on notice number 3403, asked by the Honourable Diane Evers. Those documents are tabled. Are there any further answers from any Minister or Parliamentary Secretary? If not, members, we return to order of the day number 12, birth, death.